I must say, it did take a while this week. It's already Thursday morning, but thank God we are here in the Torch Center, and we have a brand new Parsha podcast. I think it's a dandy. I think it's a good one. If it is, let me know. My email address is rabbywallbeijima.com. If you were disappointed with this week's installment of the Parsha podcast, you should get your money back, a full refund, just send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Whenever we get to this Parsha, to Parsha's Baloscha, I am always amazed and astonished by the sheer diversity of interesting subjects featured in one Parsha. Of course, it starts off with the kindling of the menorah. Rashi tells us that Aaron was disappointed that neither he nor his tribe were represented last week. At the end of last week's parasha, we read about the gifts of the princes at the inauguration of the Mishkan. And the tribe of Levi was not featured. So Aaron was disappointed. And God comforted him by saying, don't worry, your role is even bigger. You get to prepare and to kindle the menorah. So that's how the parsha starts, and it continues to talk about the inauguration, and it tells us how the Levites were selected, and how they were inaugurated, and how they were designated, and how they were waved, and they were shaven. Really interesting process to take the Levites and designate them as the ones who are the priestly class of the people. And then we read about the pastoral offering on year two of the Exodus, of course, The first pastoral offering was done in Egypt on the day of the Exodus. And now it's been a whole year, and it's Pesach again. And on year two, the nation brings the pastoral offering again. And then we read about the interesting episode of a cohort of people who were impure. Why were they impure? So the Talmud gives a few different reasons. Either they were carrying Joseph's bones... So they were burying the dead body, and that rendered them impure. Or maybe they were the ones who buried Nadav and Avihu. Or maybe they buried an unidentified corpse. Regardless, they were impure. If you're impure, you can't bring the pastoral sacrifice. And they went to Moshe with a complaint. We became impure, not due to any fault of our own. Why should we lose out? Why should we be ineligible to offer the Pesach sacrifice? And indeed, Moshe consults with God, and we read about the makeup date for Pesach. Pesach Sheni, as it's called, the second Pesach, if you are incapable, for reasons beyond your control. If you're incapable of offering the pastoral offering on the 14th day of Nisan, you have a second chance on the 14th day of Er a month later. And then we read about the maneuvering of the camp, what happens when it's time to move, They've been at Sinai for almost a year. What happens when it's time to decamp and to travel elsewhere? So we get the movement of the camp guidelines. You have to follow the cloud. When it departs from atop the tabernacle, it's time to move. And you just settle wherever it settles. And then we read about the construction of the silver trumpets. Moshe had these special silver trumpets commissioned, needed to gather the nation, a certain amount of blows. And if you want to signal movements, if there's a war, if there is various sacrifices, you need some musical accompaniment. Again, really interesting thing here featured in our Parsha. And finally, we have the first movement from Sinai. They've been there since the middle of Exodus. It's almost a year. And there's this organized breakup of the camp, tribe by tribe. There's the disassembly of the tabernacle, everyone's in place, everything is organized to perfection, and they leave Sinai, and they travel to the wilderness of Paran, and again, they're guided by these clouds of glory. Moshe tries to persuade his father-in-law Jethro to join them. You have to remember, they're under the impression that entrance to the land is imminent, and we have those iconic backwards-facing nuns these two verses that may be their own book, and that's when all the trouble begins. The people start complaining. Initially, they complain, almost like a generic complaint, and they're struck by God with fire. And then they complain about the manna. We're so sick of this manna. We want some meat. They have a meat 
craving and they complain about their familial situations and Moshe is exasperated with his monumental task of bearing the yoke of this nation and he asks for relief. If not, just kill me. I can't handle this anymore. And God tells him about the quail and God tells him to select 70 lieutenants. These are the Sanhedrin. And he chooses 72 candidates so that every tribe has six candidates. And he tells them all to pick out some papers out of a hat. And in the hat, there are 72 papers, two blank ones, and 70 that say the word elder on it. And the 72 candidates are supposed to come and make this selection. But two people who were part of the candidate list, they are... Eldad and Maydad, they're so convinced that they're going to pick up blank ones. They say, you know what? I'm not even going out to the selection process, to the selection committee. They remain in the camp. And what do you know? Other people picked up the blank notes, the blank slips, and they begin to prophesy because they, in absentia, they become prophets and they start to talk about the death of Moshe and the conquest of the land under Joshua. And finally, we have the quail, and then the episode of Miriam getting Saras. Rashi tells us that this is connected to the episode of these two people prophesying in the camp, Eldon and Medad, who became prophets in absentia. They created a hubbub in the camp, and Miriam was talking to Tsipora, the wife of Moshe, and she quipped, that she feels bad for these new prophets, their wives now, they're going to abandon their wives like Moshe abandoned me. And this was news for Miriam. She didn't know that Moshe had abandoned his wife. And the reason why Moshe had abandoned his wife was because he was always ready for communication with God and normal marital life is inconducive to someone who can at any moment be called out to prophecy. Now, Miriam wasn't aware of that, and she questioned Moshe's superiority. He's a prophet, but guess what? So are we. Is he the only prophet? God spoke to us as well. And because she questioned Moshe's credentials as the prophet of all prophets, as the father of prophets, she got saras, and the nation waits for the conclusion of her quarantine for seven days before departing, measure for measure, Rashi tells us, for when she waited for Moshe, when he was placed in a box, in the Nile, as an infant. Again, a sprawling parasha, all kinds of interesting ideas, all kinds of interesting storylines and narratives. And I want to share an idea that seems to be a major theme in our parasha, but it's also a wonderful life lesson in our pursuit of unlocking our potential. Let's start over here. In the middle of the Parsha, we have the guidelines for travel. You got to follow the cloud. When the cloud leaves, departs from atop the tabernacle, it's time to move. You have to disassemble. Everyone get in position and let's follow the cloud and see where it settles because that's where we are settling. But if you read the description in chapter 9 of our Parsha, chapter 9, verse 17 through 23, you'll find that it is quite wordy. It's quite verbose. Unlike, you know, the Torah typically is very succinct, says it in as few words as possible. If you read the description over here, it's quite lengthy. Let me read it to you. And whenever the cloud was lifted from atop the tent, the tent is another name for the tabernacle, afterwards the children of Israel would journey. And in the place where the cloud would rest, there the children of Israel would encamp. This is verse 17. And this tells us really all that we need to know, right? When the cloud moves, it's time to move. And when the cloud settles down, that is where we encamp. But then the verse continues. According to the word of Hashem, of God, would the children of Israel journey, and according to the word of Hashem, would they encamp. All the days that the cloud would rest upon the tabernacle, they would encamp. When the cloud lingered upon the tabernacle many days, the children of Israel would maintain the charge of Hashem and would not journey. Sometimes the cloud would be upon the tabernacle for a number of days. According to the word of Hashem, would they encamp 
and according to the word of Hashem, would they journey. And sometimes the cloud would remain from evening until morning, and the cloud would be lifted in the morning, and they would journey. Or for a day and a night, and the cloud would be lifted, and they would journey. Or for two days, or a month, or a year. When the cloud would linger over the tabernacle, resting upon it, the children of Israel would encamp and would not journey. But when it was lifted, they would journey. According to the word of Hashem, they would encamp. And according to the word of Hashem, they would journey. The charge of Hashem would they safeguard, according to the word of Hashem, through Moshe. We have seven verses here. It seems very redundant, very repetitive. There's this protracted description. It seems to me that the first verse would be enough. You follow the cloud and you settle wherever it settles. Why do we need the whole spiel? Three times we're told, per the word of Hashem, they would travel. Per the word of Hashem, they would encamp. And it's describing sometimes they're there for one day and two days and a month and a year. Why is it so unnecessarily verbose? So there's an amazing Sepharno, one of the great commentators on the Torah. And he tells us that the Torah is outlining the various different challenges of this system of travel. And by telling us the various different challenges of this system of travel, we just follow the clouds and you really don't really know ahead of time. You don't have an itinerary when we're going where. By telling us how difficult it was, it's highlighting the qualities of this nation that they were able to live under these conditions. So it tells us that sometimes the cloud would lead them to a place of shrieking desolation and wilderness. It would stop in a most inhospitable location. And of course, we would be cranky. Couldn't you find a nicer place? Moshe, really? This is not exactly the Four Seasons. What are we doing here? Is there a better place to encamp? But no, they listened to Hashem. And they followed Hashem. And this is where Hashem wants them to be. And sometimes they would be in this terrible place. For a long time. Maybe you could say, you know what? We could suffer here in this Motel 6. We could suffer in this Holiday Inn. We could suffer on this tent on the rocky beach. It's okay. It's tolerable for a day or two. But sometimes they'll be there for a long time. Spending a long time in a bad place, that is doubly challenging. And they would not seek another place to go to they wouldn't try to leave early. And sometimes they would stop in a really pleasant place. It's a good place. It's gorgeous, got great views, a pleasant oasis in the desert. And now this is where we want to settle. And they will be there for a day or two. It's time to leave. Moshe, we're leaving this place. It's so nice. It's so pleasant. It's so bucolic. Why are we leaving? That didn't move the needle. Alpi Hashem Yachanu, as per the word of Hashem, they encamped, not because they liked the place, not because it was scenic and pleasant, it was because Hashem says, this is where you stop. And when Hashem says, this is where, this is when you leave, they would leave from that delightful and enjoyable place. And finally, it tells us another compliment of the Jewish people that they conform to this system. Sometimes, the timing was unpredictable. They'd be there only for a night, or a day or two, or a month, or a year, and they never knew exactly when it was time to leave. And sometimes it was just, you know, one day, and they did not even have enough time to unpack and settle down. It's time to move again. And sometimes they finally unpacked, and they finally got their bearings, and they finally got used to the environment. Oh, you ready to settle down over here? This seems like a good place. Time to move, the cloud lifts, the trumpets are blown, everything's got to be dismantled, all your plans, all your preparations, up in the smoke, we're off to places unknown. They have to change their plans. Nevertheless, al pi Hashem yachano, as per the word of Hashem, they encamped. Va'al pi Hashem yiso, and as per the word of Hashem, they traveled. The times were unpredictable. The locations were often undesirable. The quality of the encampment was quite varied. The destination was not known ahead of time. This is a crazy way to live. 
This is a crazy way to travel. You're never sure when, where, how you're going to settle. And all your movements are all dictated by God via those clouds. This is how the nation lived for 40 years. And that's why the Torah elaborates upon it. it says the Sforno, to highlight their qualities, they were subject to the apparent whims of the divine and the fact that they were obedient and they willfully suffered under the system. That is a great praise of the people. And that is why the Torah wants to highlight it, to tell us how committed this nation was to follow God come what may. Now, the Kabbalists, they say something very deep here. They quote the Zohar. The Zohar focuses on a verse in Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 15, that talks about the great wilderness, the great and terrifying wilderness, full of serpent and snake and scorpion and thirst and privation and lack of water. And the Zohar says, this is not merely referring to a very difficult place to live on a physical realm, but on a spiritual realm as well. In the desert, there are all kinds of noxious spiritual forces. And that's what the nation had to contend with. And for 40 years, they are being brought to places where there is an environment, where there are forces that are fighting against their standing. This is a very special nation. The nation that witnessed the Exodus and the Sinai Revelation, and they're eating manna, and they have Moshe in their midst. This is a very elevated and lofty nation. And they're placed in a location where the forces, the environment, are antithetical to their status, and they have to fight tooth and nail to maintain their righteousness and their holiness. And they're trying to kind of cleanse the world of forces that are antithetical to God. And whenever they got to a place, it varied. Sometimes it was a pleasant place spiritually, and sometimes it was a very difficult place spiritually. And when they got to a difficult place spiritually, they were thrust into a great challenge. They had to fight to maintain their spiritual standing. And they wanted to flee. That was the urge. Let me get out of this crazy place, because otherwise I'm going to lose my standing. I'm going to lose my stature. Nevertheless, as per the word of Hashem, they encamped. And as per the word of Hashem, they decamped, they departed. And sometimes they would be there for a long time. Because there was so much of a force that they needed to defeat, it took a long time of the nation fighting and resisting and overcoming and ultimately triumphing until that place was cleansed. And once that place was cleansed, it was a pleasant place spiritually. And they wanted to remain there. Now it's finally good. Now this is a place where we could settle down and flourish. And guess what? The trumpets blast. It's time to move. You have successfully completed this task. Now it's time to move on to the next task. Al pi Hashem Yiso, as per the word of Hashem, they must travel. And sometimes they got to a place and it was kind of pleasant. There weren't so many forces needed to be overcome. This is a great place to settle down. This is a place of spiritual bliss, of spiritual relaxation. I don't feel so much pushback. I don't feel those headwinds. You stay there for a day. It's time to leave to move on to the next challenge. I think this idea, just a tremendously powerful idea, but it also resolves a critical question. Why did the Jews have to spend these 40 years in the wilderness? You know, we think of the Jews as wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. That cannot be farther from the truth. They were in the wilderness on a mission to fix all the spiritual blemishes present there. And it was a constant state of battle and struggle and conflict. 
We think of the quality of these encampments as, you know, the amenities, as if we're comparing Airbnbs. The Kabbalists tell us that it was about the spiritual atmosphere that they were thrust into. The nation would have to struggle to maintain their lofty state. And by battling those inherent forces of the location of their encampment, they managed not only to preserve their standing, but also to defeat those noxious forces. And once they succeeded in one place, well, now it's been elevated. It's now a place of spiritual bliss and pleasantness, and they wanted to stay there. But the cloud lifted and directed them to the next battleground. Some places would only need a day or two of fighting to elevate and transform a place. Others demanded years, and the clouds never relented. The clouds always directed them to the next challenge, to the next mission, to the next spiritual task that they needed to accomplish. Now, I will tell you, some of the Kabbalists present this idea in a positive sense. We're talking about fixing the problems inherited in a place. Some present it with a positive spin, that every place has some sparks of holiness. There are sparks of holiness amidst spiritual desolation, and they were there to pick up those spiritual sparks. But regardless, the Kabbalists are describing the sojourn of the Jews in the wilderness as one that amounted to nonstop contending with opposing spiritual forces. Now, this explains the whole notion of the wilderness, but it also explains our history, the role of the Jewish people and the history of the Jewish people throughout the centuries and millennia. The commentaries tell us that ultimately the Jewish people, over the course of their 40 years in the wilderness, they encamped in 42 different locations. And this corresponds, our sages tell us, to the 42 different locations where the Jewish nation will be exiled over the course of our history. And again, there's like a divine cloud of sorts that moves us from place to place. And when we fix the spiritual flaws in a given place, when we redeem those sparks, then we're finished with that task and we're removed from that place, and we're sent elsewhere on to our next challenge. And once we've done all 42, it's time to go back to Israel, just like the Jewish people in the wilderness. Once they did place number 42, it's time to cross over the Jordan. And we have a tradition, going back hundreds of years, from the great Rabbi Chaim Volozhener, he said that place number 42 in the national, so to speak, global wilderness before returning to Israel, before Messiah, place number 42, encampment number 42 is America. And he added that when Torah flourishes in America, when we redeem the sparks in this country, when we uplift when we correct, when we fix the flaws inherent in this land, then we know we've reached the end of the road. And Messiah, i.e. crossing over the Jordan, i.e. returning to the land, is imminent. I will tell you this, I mentioned in the past, but it's so wonderful, I have to say it again. The great Rabbi Shach who was the leader of Torah Jewry in the 80s and the 90s and the early aughts, the early aughts. He passed away in 2002, I think. He said that when Rabbi Chaim Valajner said that Torah flourishes in America is going to amount to the time of the Messiah, he wasn't referring to New York and New Jersey, those hotbeds of Torah life. He was referring to Texas. When Torah flourishes in Texas, that's when you know you are within striking distance. I'm saying that from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. 
So I just find that so particularly moving, I have to share it, even though we've said it in the past. But the big picture, a fascinating idea. Our nation went through a wilderness before we got to Israel. And that happened to the nation in the past. And that is forecasting what's going to happen to the nation over the course of our history. We're going to go through a wilderness. We're going to spend time in various different places in the exile, in the diaspora. And sometimes we'll feel very comfortable in a certain place and we want to stay there. And the clouds just move us. They shove us out of Portugal and Poland and France and Spain and Iraq and Persia and North Africa. All these places where the Jewish people had spent many, many decades and centuries and we got very comfortable there. Once our national mission was fulfilled in that location, the clouds lifted and they moved us elsewhere. An amazing idea. Our travels, both through the wilderness and through the globe as a nation, that is for a purpose. That's to accomplish a certain national mission, national goal of elevating the world, of redeeming those sparks, of correcting and fixing the flaws, of making the world hospitable to God by removing all those countervailing forces. And once our job is complete, we go back to the Holy Land. As an aside, we're told three times in the Torah that we're not allowed to go back to Egypt. If you live permanently in Egypt, you are violating three laws in the Torah. And the commentaries explain for this reason. The Jewish nation spent a significant time in Egypt, and on a cosmic level, what we did is we cleansed the land and we redeemed those parts, and now our job there is done. We don't need to go back there. We fixed what was needed to fix. We redeemed what was necessary to redeem. And our national work there is done. It's been cleansed. It's been elevated. We're not allowed to go back there because the clouds have departed. Our focus is on the next task. Fascinating idea. We're here to work. We're here to accomplish. Our instincts tell us, settle down, kick up your legs, sit on a hammock, relax, find a place of comfort. But the clouds are relentless. They want us to fix. They want us to elevate. They want us to perfect. They want us to refine. And we don't choose our challenges. We don't have this big global picture of what needs to be redeemed? Where are those sparks that need to be extracted? Where are those spiritual blemishes? We don't have the ability, the, the senses to determine that, but it's not our job. That is God's job to take us, to move us, to navigate us from conquest to conquest. And our nation modeled this over the course of their 40 years in the wilderness, the cloud leading them to the correct place for the next challenge and leaving them for the correct amount of time. And when the task is completed, it's on to the next task. And that's our job collectively as a nation ever since. This goes even a little bit deeper. Not only is this true on a national level, this is true on an individual level as well. What are we here for? So she just tell us, we're here to fix. We're here to preserve the purity of our soul amidst all of the challenges to its purity. We're here to rectify ourselves. We're here to elevate ourselves. The role of humanity could have been completed by Adam. Had Adam been successful in his challenge, had he made it all the way to Shabbos without sinning, that would have ushered humanity into the next epoch of history. 
Instead, his job was distributed to all of us. We can say, had the Jewish nation not sinned in the wilderness, that would have been the equivalent of Adam not sinning in the garden. But because the nation did not succeed in those 42 challenges, we still have work to do. Because Adam didn't succeed in his challenges, we, as humanity, we still have some responsibility to do. We have some things to fix. Now, each individual is given a little slice of what's left over from Adam's job. And we all have our own little guidance, our own little guiding cloud directing us to our task. We can crystallize our mission here. Of course, we know that there is a general mission, which is the 613 mitzvos, but then there's the specific mission for every individual. We talk about this all the time. And what we need to do is to defeat those forces, to overcome those challenges, to successfully triumph over our challenges. And thereby we accomplish the incomplete mission of Adam. We fix what needs to get fixed. We finish the unfinished business. And we know that the clouds are going to guide us to where our next challenge lies. We're here to defeat evil. In our literature, the evil that we each face individually, personally, is known as the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. And that conquest, overcoming that challenge, that's how we achieve our greatness. That's how we unlock our potential. And everyone's very different. Every individual's different. And to the degree of someone's potential is the strength and the potency of the challenges that they need to overcome. If you're someone who's destined for real greatness, you have to know that opposing you, standing in your way, is a commensurately large and capable and potent Yetzirah. There's a Talmud that we like to quote a lot here. In the book of Sukkah, page 52a. It talks about in the future, God will take the Yetzahara, the evil inclination, and slaughter it in front of the righteous and the wicked. And everyone's crying. The wicked, they'll look at the Yetzahara and look like a strand of hair. They'll cry, how do we not defeat the strand of hair? And the righteous will look at the Yetzahara and will look to them like an imposing mountain. And they'll cry and say, how do we defeat this mountain? So this is a time that we've quoted in the past. I'm sure you know it well. But the obvious question that everyone asks is, wait a minute, the Almighty slaughters one thing. How does it appear to the righteous as a mountain and to the wicked as a strand of hair? Now in my book, shout out, Upon a Ten-Stringed Harp, I suggested an answer to this question. But my grandfather, blessed memory, quoted from his teacher, from his Rebbe, the great Rebbe Rucham, a different answer. Indeed, the righteous, they have a larger Yetzahara. They have more potential for greatness. And therefore, that's why they have a bigger challenge. The kind of challenges that they face in life, the kind of obstacles they need to overcome in their pursuit of greatness are much bigger, much stronger, much more potent. It's a mountain. For someone who's wicked, they have less potential. All they needed to overcome was just a little strand of hair, and they failed at that as well. We all have an individual mission in life. And tailored to that, we have individual challenges in life. And we walk through our wilderness for 40 years or 70 years or 120 years. And the cloud is going to guide us to our next challenge. We're going to be positioned to be able to fulfill our mission. That's very important to wait for the clouds. We don't go seeking 
tests and challenges. We don't want to provoke the Yetzirah. We don't want to take them on ourselves. We wait until the clouds guide us, so to speak, to our next challenge until God kind of repositions us for our new challenge. So this idea, again, it appears in many different dimensions. We have the Jewish people in the wilderness, and they're trying to collectively solve all the evil in the world. We have Adam before his sin, and when that failed, that's given to all of us. Every individual, we all have our own unique challenges. Every community, every generation. It used to be that the yeshiva students 100 years ago, they weren't tempted with the temptations that we have today. They weren't tempted to, you know, waste their time, go on their phones and look at all kinds of terrible things. Their temptation was to join the socialist revolution and to be Bolsheviks or Menshevics to free the world from the opiate of the masses to expand our consciousness. I don't think there's a single yeshiva student today out of, I don't know, hundreds of thousands that's tempted to join Viva la Revolution, to join the communists. That's just, that's just not a temptation anymore. But it was rampant a hundred years ago in the yeshiva. In the year 1905, the majority the majority of yeshiva students in the world left the yeshiva to join the communists. Such a thing is totally unheard of today. It's unthinkable. Why? Because the cloud has moved. The cloud on this generational level has moved to a different challenge. And we have to know that we're going to be directed to these challenges. And once we succeed... We may want to finally exhale and say, wow, we did it. Now let's spend some time savoring it. But the cloud is going to leave. The trumpets are going to blast. It's time to move. An amazing insight here. Every person is given their job. Every person is directed to go do it, a la the cloud ascending and relocating. And it's not, it's not supposed to be easy. After a triumph, you want to break. Ah, let me just stay here a little bit. But no, God does not allow us to do that. We have a next opportunity, a next challenge. We're not allowed to get stultified and calcified and ossified. It's always fresh. Never a dull moment, as my mom likes to say. And the next conflict is going to be orchestrated from above. If that is where the cloud is guiding you to, that's where you need to go. That's where you need to work on. Of course, we struggle with this. We tend to want different challenges for ourselves. We wish the cloud was elsewhere. And I was thinking, you know, we find in our Parsha, individuals all over our Parsha who wish their cloud was elsewhere. By my count, we have at least three individuals in our Parsha who were not pleased with the location of their own personal cloud. They wanted something else. Parsha starts off with Aaron. At the end of last year's parasha, we have the 12 tribes and the 12 heads of the tribes, and they're offering these very elaborate offerings to mark the inauguration of the tabernacle. Aaron's cloud is telling him, you're not part of this. This challenge is not for you. The gift of the princes is not for the tribe of Levi. And Aaron laments. Why is my cloud not here? Why don't I, or at least my tribe, have a portion of this inauguration? Aaron seemed to be disappointed with the location of his, so to speak, cloud. And then we have the story of the the Pesach. It's year two. And there are people who are impure, not due to any 
action on their part. And the cloud, God is telling them, you're impure, it's not your fault, but you're ineligible. You are not eligible for this pastoral sacrifice. This is not what you need to do right now. And they complain, why not? Why should we be any worse than the people who offer the sacrifice? And then we have Eldad and Medad. Moshe has 72 candidates, and they're candidates to become prophets. And the cloud, the will of God, that determined that they're supposed to be prophets. And they said, we're not joining that. We're not going to go out where the cloud seems to tell us, go join the selection process. We don't feel qualified to be prophets. All these three, Aaron, the impure people, Eldon and Medad, they seem to have different plans that the Almighty had for them. The clouds seem to ordain, Aaron, you're not supposed to be part of the offering of the princes. Impure people, it's not your fault, but you don't bring the pastoral offering. Eldon and Medad, you are supposed to be outside with the selection committee. And they all had different ideas. And I think if we study what happened to all these three I think there's a different lesson to be learned from each one of them that will help us navigate our own 40 or 70 or 120 years in the wilderness trying to accomplish what God wants of us following those maddening clouds. Aaron wanted to offer something together with the rest of the tribes, for the inauguration of the tabernacle. And God tells him, Shalcha gadol mishalahem, what I have in store for you is superior to what they had. Now you may remember last year, I asked the question in the Parsha podcast, why can't Aaron have both? Let him have both the offering of the tribes, of the gifts of the princes, and the kindling of the menorah. So in last year's Parsha Pachas, we explained how they are mutually exclusive. In this instance, where Aaron was disappointed with the location of his cloud, the answer given to him is that Aaron, by forfeiting the gifts of the princes, you got something even bigger. Sometimes you're disappointed because the cloud's in a good place, but really God has a better plan for you and says your cloud's going to be in a better place. And by forfeiting something small, in exchange, he got something even bigger. When we're disappointed with the location of our challenges, where the clouds are guiding us, sometimes the reason is because there's even a bigger opportunity that we're going to have instead. The impure people, they were absolved from offering the pastoral sacrifice. They had a legitimate excuse the cloud was elsewhere. But they insisted, they wanted, they wanted that cloud. They wanted that challenge. They wanted that opportunity. They wanted more. They wanted more responsibility. They wanted a bigger portion of Adam's responsibility on their shoulders. And Moshe consulted with God. And God said yes. And they were given the second Pesach, the makeup date. I think in this instance, we learn another element of this structure, of this construct. And that is that you can sometimes effectuate change in the kind of challenge that the clouds seem to ordain for you. Can you get more responsibility? Can you opt in to a greater challenge? On your own, you can't. But if you really desire it, sometimes God will roll the cloud to give you more responsibility. And then we have Eldad and Medad. They felt unworthy to be prophets. We're not going to join the selection committee because we know we're going to pick up the blank ones. We're definitely not worthy of prophecy. And yet, they got it nonetheless. 
Sometimes a person looks at the location of his cloud or her cloud and they say, there's no way I'm up to the task. There's no way I'm worthy of this role. But nevertheless, if that is where the clouds are pushing you towards, obviously you have it within you. You have the ability within you. You just don't know it. But God believes in you more than you believe in yourself. And you just need to discover it. You need to overcome those feelings. Who were Eldad and Medad? So if you look at the Targum Yonasan, he says they were actually brothers, half-brothers of Moshe and Aaron. According to one opinion, they were half-brothers and they shared a dad, Amram. According to other opinions, they were half-brothers and they shared a mom, Yochevet. To me, I found this really interesting. We could even suggest or speculate that Moshe also did not like the location of his cloud at one point in his journey. When God appointed him to go save the Jewish people, he said, no, choose choose someone else. He launched a whole salvo of objections to God's plan. He tried to wiggle out of it, but he was not given a choice. So maybe there's some sort of kind of familial tendency to not believe that you're up to the task when really you are. Now, I'm just thinking about this now. This is not in my notes. This is an extemporaneous musing for the few of y'all that are still listening. Aaron also didn't feel like he was up to the task. You remember Parsha Shemini where Aaron is told to go bring the offering and he's diffident and he says, I can't do it. And he seems to visualize the horns of the Mizbeach, of the altar. It reminds him of the horns of the golden calf. Aaron, too, did not feel up to the test. So maybe there's something in the family. They're all destined for great things. And the challenge that they need to overcome, or the lesson that they need to learn, and I think it's a good lesson for some of us, is that if God believes in you, and God places your cloud in a place where you don't believe that you're up to the test, You're destined for great things, and God believes in you to this degree that he gives you this responsibility. Evidently, you're up. The task. We are all here on a mission. Of course, we have the the general mission that we know really well. It's well documented. Six and thirteen mitzvot, every Jew is obligated by all of them. That's the universal mission of all of us. But we all have on top of that a personal mission as well. And all of our skills and our assets and our strengths are all tailored to enable us the opportunity to overcome that mission, to successfully conquest that mission, to defeat those forces, to redeem those parts, to elevate however you want to say it, however you want to phrase it. And that mission is going to be composed of various different challenges. Call them stations or encampments. And we're here to overcome those challenges, to successfully succeed in those missions, in those tasks, to elevate ourselves, to elevate those around us, to accomplish our little slice of Adam's job, bit by bit, station by station, task by task, encampment by encampment. How do we know? What challenge we need to work on? It's pretty simple. That's not our job. That's God's job. He will guide us in the wilderness with his clouds. The 613, that part we know. To find out what our specific individual mission is, for that, we will be guided from above. And we're going to be placed in situations that you may feel an urge to escape from. It's too hard. Get me out of here. And we may feel that we want at some other location. Or we may feel like the place that we're presented, the challenge that we're presented in life is too difficult for us. We have to follow the rules, the guidance of the Jewish people. To successfully unlock our potential, 
on a national level, on an individual level, on a communal level, on a generational level. We have to remember the example set forth by the Jews in the wilderness in our parsha. Al pi Hashem yachanu, val pi Hashem yisau, as per the word of God, they encamped. And as per the word of God, they traveled. Let's get to this week's exquisite insight. And I think this week will definitely qualify as exquisite and as an insight. It's exquisite because it's so interesting. It's an insight because I don't feel like I'm qualified to explain it. I could read Hebrew, as I always like to say. But it's such an advanced idea. I saw it. I'm like, oh, this is something I'm going to save for the end of the podcast. For whoever's still listening, because this I found to be really exquisite, and it's an insight. The Jewish people in our parsha they complain, they want meat. We're so sick of the manna. We're so done with the manna. We can't look at it even anymore. We miss the onions and the garlic and the cucumbers. In Egypt, we're craving for some meat. I need to see some sizzle, medium rare. I cannot look at any more manna. And the verse kind of transitions, seems to be a little bit obliquely, to Moshe hearing the nation crying about their families. So you have this this very long description here, starting in chapter 11, verse 4, about the complaining about the meat and remembering the fish that we used to eat and the and the onions and all that, and we're sick of the manna. And the verse describes how the how amazing the manna was. And then you have this very awkward transition to the nation or to Moshe hearing the nation complaining about their families. Rashi says that they were complaining about all the new restrictions on familial life. But it does seem to be a little bit of an unusual segue. And in general, we have to understand what is the nature of this meat craving. And it seems to be related to the lamenting over the family. So I saw the Chassam Sofer, a very reputable source, who gives a Kabbalistic explanation of why they wanted to eat the meat and how it relates to their family. And this is what he says. And of course, I always encourage you to email me, rabbiwolby at gmail.com, rabbis with two Bs. And I always welcome your questions. And I know I have a very burgeoning inbox. So if you are listening, you're like, hey, how come Rabbi Wolby hasn't responded to the email I sent him a couple of days ago? I promise I will get to it. Please, God. But what I'm going to tell you now is something that I cannot answer in an email. Because I don't really know what I'm talking about. I can read Hebrew, but I don't really know what I'm talking about. So you'll forgive me that I can't really elaborate upon this. The Chazam Sofer, I am very, very reputable. He says, he reminds us that with the Exodus, it wasn't the whole nation leaving. We left some men behind. In fact, we've mentioned this many times, 80% of the Jews didn't make it out of Egypt. They died in Egypt. So every family had relatives that were dead and buried in Egypt. And when it says that Moshe heard the nation crying about their family, that was a reference, according to the Chazam Sofer, that was a reference to their family that was dead, deceased, and buried in Egypt. And how does this relate to the meat? So he explains, he quotes the Kabbalists. The Kabbalists tell us that sometimes if a soul goes up to heaven and it has not accomplished its mission in life, so a variety of things could happen to it. Some, sometimes they end up in various levels of purgatory, which is a pretty good place to end up, we're told. And sometimes they are reincarnated, they come back for a second go-round 
to be able to finish what they left incomplete. But sometimes the nature of that reincarnation is that they don't come back as another human, but they come back as a food item. Wow, did you know this? They come back as a food item. A kosher food item. Well, let me rephrase that. It doesn't say they come back as a food item. A spark of their soul ends up embedded in a kosher food item. And in the event that that kosher food item, let's just imagine it's a cow, it's a bovine, it's a kosher animal. And it gets slaughtered in the proper way. And it gets prepared in a kosher fashion. And the person who eats it makes a blessing on the food. And eats it and assimilates that in their body. That spark has been redeemed. That soul has been fixed. It's been elevated. Says the Chassam Sofer. His words, not mine. (laughs) The Jewish people were complaining about their families. And they wanted to eat meat. They were eating manna, but they're thinking about their brethren that they left behind. And they're like, maybe they're in the meat. And we're not eating any meat. So we want to eat the meat because we want to elevate and save and redeem our family members. And that's why they crave the meat. And that explains the juxtaposition of their complaint about their family. And they're crying. They're bewailing over their family. And he explains why that really wasn't a good argument. But what an exquisite insight. A, this whole notion of a soul or some element of a soul coming back embedded in a food item and being redeemed and elevated and rectified and fixed via the kosher consumption of that item. A, B, this whole, such a bizarre thing. You think about this nation. (laughs) They experienced Sinai Moshe eating manna. They witnessed the plagues in Egypt, the splitting of the sea. This is an exalted nation. This is an elevated people. And they seem to have this desire for some meat, some grub. It seems so inconsistent with who they are as a people. According to this, some so far, at least we have an explanation to understand what may have been going on behind the scenes and how it could be really something very lofty and very advanced. Again, it's an insight. I found this to definitely be exquisite. What it actually means, how this actually works is, of course, a great mystery. But I thank you for listening to it nonetheless. I hope you're having as wonderful a day as I am. Nay, even better! Even better! Have a wonderful day, a wonderful rest of your week. It's already Thursday when I'm recording this. The 16th day of June. As you know, I typically try to get it all done much earlier in the week. Please forgive me. I assure you, it was a really busy week. I was not dilly-dallying. I wasn't wasting my time. Well, maybe a little bit. A little bit wasting my time. But it was a very incredibly busy week. Maybe one day I'll tell you about everything that happened over this week. Thank you for listening. Have an incredible day. I'm in the Torch Center. I hope you come to visit once. If you don't visit the Torch Center, visit our website, torchweb.org. Send me an email, rabbochuba.com. Have an amazing day, an incredible week, a wonderful, uplifting, transformative, sensational, stupendous Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.